Have you ever learned something so obvious that you felt a little embarrassed? See, my friend Kyle and me, we share a massive love for voice acting. Commander Shepard is, of course, a hard-bitten, ruthless individual. She'll do whatever has to be done to do the right thing. And, and Kyle, well, <laughs> he thinks it's hilarious that when he talks about voice acting to family members, that they respond with some variation of, oh, wow, yeah, I guess that is a job. Or, huh, yeah, yeah I, never, I never thought about how there's a real person behind SpongeBob. Stay with me here. Because before I started playing Final Fantasy XIV, I never once stopped to think about the voices behind my favorite video game songs. If you've never streamed a game before, there's this thing that, that can happen. Pre-hype. Pre-hype is very real. If the audience watching you has already played the game you're playing, they can start absolutely buzzing with excitement about what is about to come next. This happened over and over during Kyle and my first playthrough of Final Fantasy XIV, usually for major story beats. That made sense to me. I learned pretty fast that the XIV fandom loves the story of XIV and is all about reliving that experience through streamers. But what caught me off guard consistently until, I don't even want to admit this, damn near the final expansion, was the chat room rumbling to the point of rupture because they just could not wait for the music that was about to needle drop in the next scene. And friends, in Shadowbringers and Unwalker, there's a voice the players cannot get enough of. Welcome and well met, my brave little spark. How long you've wandered, burned bright as a star. Oh, I have awaited you patiently all this time. And today, we're going to talk with her about what it's like to be one of the most prominent voices in an epic tale as massive as Final Fantasy XIV. So please join us, my friend Kyle Ferguson, me, Garrett Weinzerl, and for the first time on this channel, multi-genre soprano, Final Fantasy XIV singer, and the cause of many gamers' tears, Amanda Aiken, for a new episode of MSQ&A, where we are revisiting the music of Final Fantasy XIV and the story of A Realm Reborn. <laughs> to kind of frame this for folks that are, you know, maybe not as familiar with uh, all three people who are here's journey through Final Fantasy XIV. At the time of recording this, Kyle and I recently completed our journey, at least up through the end of M Walker 6.0. Uh, it's been like a two and a half year journey for us. Um, but as for today's discussion, and and spoilers, in case you are not caught up on Final Fantasy XIV and you're worried, uh, don't be. Um, we're going to be talking about the music of Final Fantasy XIV all the way up through M Walker, but we're going to save that discussion for the end of the show. And we're going to kind of ramp up to it. So we're going to have a, a spoiler free discussion and we'll give you plenty of warning when we're going to start talking about all of the ways um, songs that feature Amanda will probably make you cry and I'm walking. And I'll go, I'll la, 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 la. <laughs> and that's because, uh, Amanda, you started streaming your first playthrough of Final Fantasy fourteen fairly recently, I think late last year, right? Yeah, in August, after I did the um, first fan fest in Vegas, I just saw how amazing the community is and I wanted to be more plugged in. And between Vegas and London Fan Fest, I was actually traveling for three months in Europe. Um, that was a crazy trip. I was in a different city every week and a different country every other week. And that's when I started streaming. So Whoa. it was a remote streaming experience. Jeez. Yeah, it was totally trial by fire. Um, dealing with different Wi-Fi, which by the way, like kind of by and large, Wi-Fi in Europe is generally better than Wi-Fi in America. Oh. So I was pretty good kind of no matter where I went. Um, but yeah, I had I had a mobile streaming setup. I brought my um, LED floodlight, totally essential. Looks good anywhere I put it. I had a USB mic and I just... I, I have Apple products, which is absolutely insane. I've been playing Final Fantasy XIV on a Mac, which is crazy, oh but, but I had my MacBook. And then I used my phone as my camera. And like, 
that was all I needed. Pretty good, pretty solid. As you can see now, I just got a fancy camera and I feel really um, bougie and professional. <laughs> I wanted I wanted that blurry background. Now I have it. I'm like, yes, I've made it. I am a streamer. Um, but yeah, I, I started back in August while I was traveling. And and since I've been back in LA after London, that was kind of in October, then I've been streaming here. And I've got my setup going, as you can see it. And uh, I stream about twice a week. And I um, kind of move very slow because I talk to chat a lot. <laughs> I think I've been slowly progressing through MSQs, but yeah, it's been about seven months now. I think you'll be in good company here because they're used to how how fast we go through, um, which is slow. The game, which we're is slow. extremely yeah, you're in good yeah. company. Yeah, I just want to yeah. be like the grinding gears guys on their timeline. <laughs> oh, so that that sounds uh, uh, wild. Let's clip that quote and put it on the website, Kyle. You know, just okay. So you do fan fast, which we were there for. We were at that particular fan oh, fest oh. in Vegas. And that was the first exposure you had to just the audience losing it. That must have been invigorating. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you you guys saw when I had the moment with the microphone in my hand, too, and I was interacting with the crowd and, and everyone was screaming my name. That was the moment I'm like, I've got a stream. <laughs> That's awesome. What a cool way to, like, break out of that behind the scenes. Uh, I mean, also coming out of the lockdowns, COVID, getting to share that with everybody. Uh, yeah. But getting to be with that crowd that is running wild, cosplaying, playing mini games over here, going here, trying the game. And everyone goes, hold up, we're doing a piano recital. And everyone's like, oh, absolutely, excuse me. And they just like sit down, complete respect, dead silence. Yes, love, absolutely, please, please play the music. Yeah, it was crazy. It was so wild. It was so much fun. And that was that was a really great crowd, too. They were so enthusiastic. Um, which I feel like is kind of it. when I've performed in different countries throughout the world, I feel like the Americans are, are really the most bombastic, which is fun because coming from a classical background, everyone sits there and it's very proper and they do their little golf clap, you know, and meanwhile, Final Fantasy people are like <laughs> losing their shit so, <laughs> on the stage. That feels really good. <laughs> That was something we, we when we came back from FanFest, because it was the first one we'd ever been to. And previously, we had a lot of personal experiences going to other video game themed conferences, but never a Final Fantasy one. And what really stuck out to us from FanFest was how completely ready, willing, and on board everyone in the audience was to drastically change the tone of whatever was currently being presented. Because... Mm -hmm. It was, um, I think it was day one. The second to last event was the cosplay contest or, or walk. I don't think it's actually a contest, but the cosplay walk, which got memey and ridiculous and just hilarious towards the end. There were some really, really fun out there costumes that played to the crowd and everyone was just laughing. It was a very high energy oh, yeah. room. And immediately following that, the piano concert starts. And I was just like, wow, this room turned on a dime. This became just a yeah. giant meme fest. It was like if, if the most upvoted thing on Reddit had just become a conference. And now suddenly it's the classiest thing I've ever experienced at a gaming conference. This community has range, you guys. Good for you. <laughs> That's a yeah. good way to put it. Hey, everyone. Garrett here with a note as I'm I'm literally sitting here editing this right now. And I noticed... We actually start talking about specific tracks from Final Fantasy XIV very early into this conversation, and it kind of continues throughout. So if you're trying to avoid music spoilers, maybe pause this one. But other than that, I'm going to take care to make sure I don't have any visual spoilers if you're watching the video version of this podcast. So please enjoy. Just wanted to let you know. Back to Amanda. It was quite the experience. Uh, Kyle and I started running when the piano concert started because we hadn't, we'd barely started N Walker. <laughs> they were like, showing oh, no. video in the They're background. Showing so game footage. We, <laughs> oh, yeah. we did get to see several of your songs, including the absolute tongue twister one. Oh my God. Dancing on the wind, up and down again, round and round the bend, fa la 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 la. So I yeah, want to ask we, you about that later. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we got to see that during the piano performance. And then we did the second day. We we're like, we're not missing the primals. Whatever happens, it's out of context. Bring it on. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll risk it. And I'm so glad we yeah. did. But let, let's take it back for folks that, you know, may not be familiar. What, what's your background? How did you become a professional singer and, and end up working on, on games like Final Fantasy XIV? I'm an only child. And I always liked being the center of attention. <laughs> 
So I think that's how I became a performer. Mm, welcome to streaming. Yeah, we're. I think we're all a little guilty of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> putting on a show. Listen, <laughs> you know, just like entertain my parents. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I studied music in university. Um, I, I I was gonna maybe study musical theater, and I did this competition where I had to sing a classical song in French. It was a very sensual French song that was way above my head at the time, like senior in high school. Uh, but something about it really resonated with me. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to study classical music. And I didn't know how to read music. I didn't have any formal training, really. I just kind of had a good ear and a, and a good voice. And um, so then I was a music major and it was difficult. I almost dropped out a few times. Music theory, fucking not my thing. I kind of want to go back and study now that I'm a bit older and I have more um, experience. Um, I think it would come easier to me because at that age, I was just completely overwhelmed. Um, but yeah, I, I was a music major. I graduated. I didn't actually go get my master's, whereas a lot of classical singers did. Um, it's kind of expected in that field to just go through higher education as much as you can. A lot of people end up teaching. I think that's why. But um, I thought, no, I want to take a break from school. I just want to start performing. And um, I grew up in Southern California, so I was in Los Angeles. Well, I, I moved to Los Angeles after I graduated. And I just kind of started trying to do gigs classical things when I could get it, some um, some opera, some oratorio. An oratorio is stage work where um, concert, uh, orchestra behind me, choir, and, and a soloist out in front. So um, I really kind of leaned more that direction, um, mostly because I felt that to be successful in opera, you really had to sell your soul to the devil of opera, and you couldn't really do any other genres because opera is so fucking hard that that's just what you got to do 100% of the time. And I liked being versatile. I also knew that I would get bored if I was only doing one genre, one style of music. So uh, it opened my eyes to jazz, and my partner at the time um, was a classical musician, is a classical musician and a jazz musician, and um, I started going to some jam sessions with him for jazz. We started a band, and so then I kind of started um, professionally dipping my toes into jazz as well, and I had done a little bit of that when I was younger, but that aspect felt really authentic and really rewarding because... Um, Improvisation is a huge element of jazz, and that's something that you don't really do as a classical musician unless you are singing Baroque music, early music like Bach and so on. Um, there was a lot of improvisation in that time. And then as um, styles started changing, composers started getting really developed and intense, kind of think of like Beethoven style. Um, the music got so developed where people didn't improvise anymore. So a lot of classically trained musicians just stopped using that skill of improvisation. So there's this interesting bookend of early music and jazz, improvisation, improvisation, and like all of this area in between that doesn't improvise. And so I kind of leaned more towards early music and jazz. And a project that I really want to do at some point in my life is... Uh, uh, an album of jazz arrangements of early music songs because they just go Sweet. together. Sweet. Oh, that'd be interesting. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you're, you're talking a lot about what I know. My wife is an opera singer, so I, you, you're so my favorite language to sing. What 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 do you like best? German, actually. Uh, yeah. Which is probably also why I didn't study opera because you got to be really good at Italian, and I just never felt super comfortable with Italian. <laughs> so, oh my, well, congratulations because, yes, uh, opera can be extremely restrictive in that way. So the fact that you forged your own road and found a way to have this creative outlet as well as explore all these other things without getting stuck in kind of the the studiumness of it. Like, congratulations. That's awesome. I mean, no offense to any opera singers out there and definitely not your wife. No, but it was your passion like that. You followed your yeah. passion for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so I have so much respect for people who really dedicate their life to learning that art because it is so specific and so challenging and um, like hands down to that. And I recognized that that wasn't exactly where I felt the most 
fulfilled. And it took me a while to kind of come to terms with that and realize it's okay. I don't have to go down this road that um, was kind of visually laid out for me when I studied at school. I can carve my own path. Yes, that's difficult and challenging because it's confusing and I'm not doing, I'm not going to the young artist programs. I'm not auditioning for all of these things. I'm really kind of using a machete to cut through this forest of questions <laughs> to try to cut through. And that's when, to circle back to your initial question, like how I met Sokin, there was a Eorzean symphony that came through in, in 2018 to LA. And a company that I had worked with as a soloist doing classical stuff like Mozart's Requiem, Carmina Burana, Poulenc, kind of oratorio work. That conductor hired the choir and also was contracting the soloists. So he hired me as the soloist. And that's how I met Sokin. And the songs that I sang were Heaven's Word, um, which is crazy because it's got three high C's. It's like so wild. And, um, and a Crystal Towers theme. which I didn't realize was Crystal Towers until a few weeks ago when some of my mods did some research. And that was <laughs> kind of cool. It, uh, it, it, there were no words to it. It was just some ooze and ahs. And they were like, is this the song? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Crystal Towers. Now I have context. That's cool. Yeah. It's got to be cool along the way, kind of <laughs> filling in those. Um, I'm not even sure if you call them blanks if you don't know they're blanks at the time, but like like filling it in as you go along. It's always interesting like, too when you're. Who else has that experience? Well, and when <laughs> when you're explaining what you do to somebody, and the, if people will be like, "Wait, people read radio advertisements? Oh my goodness! Oh, someone actually did, dude. That is that's a human being." And same thing with the oohs and ahs of a background. A lot of people don't <laughs> fathom that someone had to sit there working, supporting their breath, and ooing with all their might. Ooh, ooh, ooh! So much <laughs> professional ooing, man. <laughs> a lot of that. <laughs> So, so you, so they, they need a singer. And so they brought you in and then like, what happened then? I guess I did a good job. <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I really put my all into it. Um, I, I memorized the music. I interpreted it. I came out and I don't know if anyone here was at that concert in LA in 2018, but the crowd was so excited when I walked out and sang these songs and I just felt this intense like welcome and love and support um and I I sang my songs and and you know I had this thought backstage there were two performances I think I think there were two in the same day um and I thought oh my gosh you know I really I really love working with composers this composer this music is really good I just, I'm just going to shoot my shot and give him my business card. And I actually had business cards and I haven't had business cards since. <laughs> and little <laughs> did I know that business cards are a very integral aspect of Japanese business culture. <laughs> so while I was thinking, oh, I really want to give him my business card. He apparently, I learned later, was having the same thought. He was like, oh, I really like her as a singer. I need to give her my business card. So we had a business card exchange moment backstage. And then like less than a year later, he reached out and said, hey, are you interested in recording this theme? And that was um, Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And that oh then the God. rest is history, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. And it seemed like... I want to say it seems so natural knowing all of the work that went up to that moment that you just explained, but it's, it's nice that in that, in that moment, it seemed like it just, it gelled. Yeah. I'm so grateful. You know, I, I think, um, I, the, the, the good things that come in life are, um, are like equal parts preparation and luck. <laughs> you know, I, I prepared, I really brought my a game and I was in the right place at the right time. And that's when really awesome things happen. So you never know when you're going to be in the right place at the right time. It could be any moment you walk out your house. So, you know, with that idea, you kind of want to be prepared whenever you're doing any work that is important to you. Um, but put your heart into it. I think that's kind of the moral of the story there. What a, what a fascinating audience to walk yeah. out to, the Final Fantasy audience. They are... <laughs> Tuned and experienced with a wide variety of music from jazz as well to classical. Was that your first concert doing anything related to video games? 
Yes, as a soloist. I had done other kind of video game and film score concerts um, in the choir before. I've performed with John Williams on the Hollywood Bowl stage, oh, um, nice. which is incredible, especially go- co- coming back to Star Wars now, like the Imperial Death March and everyone's got a lightsaber in their hand and they're all conducting with it. And you're looking out into the Hollywood Bowl audience, you know, and everyone's got a lightsaber. Um, but but again, it was never um, from the perspective of, of being a soloist. And um, I, yeah, it, it was so exhilarating um and i i wanted to be more part of that and um you know little did i know that i was going to get to be (laughs) and i'm grateful and now now i really want to dive more into the video game industry in general um this isn't something we've talked about and it's kind of new ish but i i've recently taken a, a voice acting course for video games with Sean Mendham, who is Scratch in Baldur's Gate 3. He is an incredible oh, nice. teacher. I have been bragging about him everywhere. Highly recommend his course. Um, Learn so much. And I really want to get more involved, not just in the singing side, but in the voice acting side. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to dig my toes in there. Uh, my dad was actually a voice actor. Uh, he did more commercial work when I was young, and then he stopped. But I grew up with him telling me stories and doing character voices. And I think that was really impactful to me when I was a child and and really kind of encouraged me to play and perform and use my voice in interesting ways. So it would be cool now if I do start doing voice acting, it would feel like a very full circle. How, <laughs> like, let's say you have to communicate an emotion. How does that feel different between singing and voice acting? Well, um, that's a great question. With singing, I think in terms of colors, shapes, I mean, how we use our voice, we're using our articulators, our our teeth, our tongue, our lips, our mouth, everything up here um, to form different sounds and different shapes. And if I'm going for something that is warm and comforting and resonant, I might really make more space in my mouth and have like a taller vowel and um, a really high soft palate. I might use specific vowel shapes to bring out different timbres in my voice that I think um, <clears throat> kind of um, sonically describe an emotion. I will certainly just feel the emotion itself. <laughs> That's like kind of the obvious thing. Um, and I think when it comes to voice acting, um, maybe I need to be slightly more specific with my imagination and with really visualizing the world that I'm in. Singing and music can be kind of abstracted concepts that hit because the music is speaking as well as the voice. But with voice acting, generally, there's no music there and it's quicker. Singing is stretched out and longer and voice acting is speaking. So I think getting a lot more specific with what I'm visualizing in the world that I'm inhabiting um, will then allow the listener to be immersed in that world just as well. And um, from this voice class, something I've learned is, you know, you you really want to move your body. You don't want to be just kind of standing there in front of the microphone. But if if I'm moving through a cave, like I'm going to be like looking around and maybe reaching out. And just that little bit of movement is going to affect how my voice is coming out. Whereas if I'm in a cave right now, maybe I'm seeing it, but it's subtle. You could probably hear a difference in the voice. I don't have a really... I'm not up against a really great mic right now, but um, yeah, um, that's a long way of saying, I think, more specification with voice acting. However, I'm going to be using those tricks now going forward when I um, record in the future and see if that gives me just a little edge on the emotion when I sing. That was an awesome comparison. Mm. So, so to that note, when you receive a song... Is there director notes with it? How much are you kind of getting in the margins and being like, oh, I think this is this kind of interpretation or how I'm going to portray this line? 
different depending on the session. If there's a director in the room there or a composer in the room there or a music director in the room, um, they might have a lot of ideas. Um, I recorded an Italian aria recently for a film. I actually wrote the Italian lyrics, which nice. uh, was fun. I used Google Translate and um, then I ran it by my Italian friend to make sure the tenses and everything were proper. But yeah, I wrote a fake Italian aria. Um, and th at that session, there was a music director in the vocal booth who was listening to me sing and he had the music in front of him and he was giving me specific notes more on um, just the like the vocal technique. Um, I've been in situations where directors might give me, okay, uh, do that one, like just kind of uh, vague emotions, like uh, more, um, more pulled back, more restrained, more um, comforting, more motherly. And with Soken specifically, he will give me um, a handful of um, descriptors, generally, like... Okay, um, I want this to be yeah, soft and um, and comforting. I keep going back to that because that's kind of what the direction was for flow. Um, you know, so he didn't for that specifically. He didn't give me context, um, and I've spoken about this in interviews before. But I didn't really necessarily need the context because there was so much in the lyrics and in the emotion of the music itself that I got it. As much as I now know about Heidelin and the spoilers that I have kind of gleaned myself and doing my own research, you know, I was like, oh, I fucking nailed that. <laughs> that was exactly <laughs> what I was imagining in my head. <laughs> so it just speaks volumes without the specific context sometimes. That's amazing. I, mean, I, think, I think we and everyone in chat can, uh, can, uh, mirror that exact feeling after everything we just uh, all, all of your work we got to just experience in Endwalker because that was definitely uh, multiple times we were just kind of like oh this is why everyone was so excited for us to get to this track I'm excited too maybe I'll do your timeline and it will be like two years from now but <laughs> I look forward to bringing you back on and being able to talk to you about Endwalker <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, with doing any sort of recording, there's going to be eventual desensitization of just hearing yourself because most people are like, oh, my God, my own voice. But it, have you always been pretty cool hearing yourself or is it something you had to get accustomed to? Well, I had to get accustomed to it. Yeah, I think in the same way that I had to get accustomed to seeing myself on the screen a lot. Um, when you first do that, you're like, whoa, I really don't know how to look at myself. This is awkward. And then you just kind of do it more and you get over it and then it becomes natural. So that was, yeah, that was um, my, how I feel generally with um, vocal recordings. And, and honestly, there are some times when there's recordings of me that um, like scratch tracks or something that I just don't listen to it and that's okay. Um, however, you, you glean so much information when you watch things back. I mean, I'm sure you guys do too. You'll be like, oh, okay, that worked really well, or I could have done that differently or better. So 100%. obviously it's a really useful tool to listen back to yourself. But back to the question you asked, um, so far the only thing that I have heard is um, every time I start the game. When I hear myself. <laughs> No big deal. Just every time I start it, you know, there I am. Just, yeah. Just, oh. for, for, for like, so when we started, um, I I purchased right before M. Walker came out. So I had the, the collection up through Shadowbringer. So every time I logged in, it was a Shadowbringer screen. And then we were streaming and one day someone gifted me an M. Walker code. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And um, suddenly it swapped to N. Walker. And for over a year now, for the longest time, I thought it was just, uh, we, Kyle and I both, in unison thought it was tales of love was what was being uh shouted no. it's gonna be a love story <laughs> everybody no nope. oh it's yeah it's become a bit of a joke in our community of yep time for like, tales oh, of love it's gonna be so wonderful and heartwarming and and not emotional and so easy <laughs> everyone's gonna have a great time it's gonna be perfect that is uh -huh. wild 
I think uh, some I'm folks in chat right now are realizing that that is in fact not what it says. Um, yeah. Realizing? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> loss, my friends. Tales of loss. <laughs> so not only did you have the distance perhaps where you were sending these files, but also the COVID time period. Were you f- recording those at home? Did you go to a studio somewhere else? How did you get that in their hands? Yes, dude. Okay, so the first recording I did was right before COVID, the, the tomorrow and tomorrow. That <clears throat> that I did in a studio with my friend. He's wonderful. Film score composer in my band. He's just like, I go to him and we get it done. Um, then when COVID happened, I recorded <clears throat> myself. I had to learn how to um, use Logic, be a studio engineer, do all my own recording, because that was the only option during COVID. And I was doing that for some other smaller projects, but then they asked me to do um, the piano arrangement. I don't remember what that was called, but What Angel Wakes Me was on there, Return to Oblivion was on there, Tomorrow and Tomorrow was on there. You guys, those songs are all like seven minutes long and really complicated and that was my intro into being my own engineer oh no (laughs) jeez intense it was so crazy it was so stressful but i learned a lot and i i quickly figured out how to like comp correctly and and i figured out an approach for myself when i record which is pretty much i'll spend the first day learning the song, usually learning the song as I'm recording it. So I'll go bit by bit. I'll go phrase by phrase, you know, I'll vague, I'll like look over the entire piece of music. Um, but I kind of learn it as I record it. And then once I get an understanding, I get it in my voice. Then the next day I'll go and record it. And it kind of has sunk in a little bit better at that point. And so then I take off the pressure of doing the recording all in one session. Um, I learned that doing those. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I'm I'm having to learn a guitar piece for a collaboration that folks in our chat room, if they think about it for more uh, a little bit, they'll probably be able to put two and two together and figure out what it's for. But I uh, just got it like the other day, and I'm like, oh, I haven't had to not suck at guitar in a while. <laughs> so, uh, and that's I went about it a very similar way. I was just like, all right, let's just I'm going to put this on loop, and I'm going to keep going through it over and over mm-hmm. again. And I'm not going to worry about trying to actually record this for a few days until I kind of can. This is just muscle memory. Yeah, um, it's important. I mean, that's the part of the preparation. You you want to get it so that it's muscle memory, so that you're not actually in the process of remembering how the song goes or reading the music when you're recording, because it's going to sound like you're reading the music or remembering how the song goes in that recording. So practicing looping, being repetitive, whatever you need to do for however many days so that by the time you're ready to record, it's actually you interpreting. That's that's how you make art. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's great to hear. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I wasn't expecting to get um, advice I'm going to use because I'm like, I don't sing, but <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of curious to like the next step from uh, obviously your first time working with, with Sokin and, and the rest of the crew to um, like, what was the onboarding like for, I, I guess you said it was tomorrow and tomorrow was the first thing you worked on. Mm-hmm. Like, like you just one day you woke up to an email and they're like, we want you for this thing. Um, like yeah. and how much, how much of it is direct? How much of it is okay. That's awesome. It's that simple. Yeah. And it was like a week turnaround. They're like, all right, great. Uh, we need this in a week. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, maybe not the turnaround, but <laughs> it's that's fantastic. Most industries like this film, TV, commercial game, it's all like, we need this yesterday. So <laughs> I'm yeah. kind of used to that. Um, the interesting part was I, I think I had just come back from a festival in Costa Rica. So they they messaged me (laughs) while I was in the airport going to Costa Rica, like in the middle of nowhere. And I said, well, I could try to find a studio in Costa Rica, but I don't know. They said, okay, just do it when you come back. So I had returned, managed to not lose my voice (laughs) in the jungle of Costa Rica. And I I had this weird ass rehearsal um i did this project for neil gaiman in 2018 that was for the good omen series where i was playing a satanic nun a singing satanic <laughs> nun um like range, right? yeah, exactly yeah, range. Satanic nun. there you we go got range. <laughs> 
And I did this rehearsal for a few hours and I was um, singing over the music at the rehearsal and everyone's like, oh, that's lovely. What is that? And I was like, just some video game thing. <laughs> and then I went to um, my friend's studio in Santa Monica and we recorded it. And uh, that's how that happened. I, I some Sometimes it's not the ideal circumstances, you know, the ideal circumstance to, to me would be not having just come back from a festival for a week and not having just done a rehearsal early in the morning. But uh, you make it work and that's the one that was used in the game. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't know what it is about the universe, but it feels like those types of opportunities only come like when you're when you're already in it with something else, like yeah, mid travel or Murphy's Law. Yeah, your your studio equipment's on fire. That's when the opportunity yeah. comes. It's never when you have a quiet moment. That's me right now. So my one of my interfaces, well, my only interface at the moment broke, and I'm like trying to finish this recording project right now. And then I bought this other interface, and because I have a Mac, it wasn't the one for the Mac, and it took me two weeks to realize that, so I have to return that and get another one. So like here I am, three weeks not being able to record in my studio because my interface is broken. Oh. So that's just how it goes. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not a techie person. I don't know how I'm streaming. It's so crazy. I'm the least techie. I've, I've become more techie, but it's, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, well, it's your wild. streams, like, they, they look great. Like, I'm, like it seems Thanks. like you put a lot of time and effort into it. So uh, I don't know. Maybe it seems like you picked up a few yeah. tricks having to become your own recording studio over COVID or something because it looks it looks solid. Well, we're still talking about just like the process of, of working with with Square and, and with Soak. And I, I mean, what, what like, just generally, what is it like working with soak in i mean you both i still feel like i know kyle and i have been doing this for a little while we've been pretty steep in final fantasy for a couple of years now but i still feel like an outsider and when we were even realizing that there was just a whole <laughs> subsection of the fandom that like their favorite thing about this entire game is the music let you and Sokin came up so much like before we, um, we even knew how to pronounce Sokin, i think the first time i ever said his name i said socket and chat thought it was hilarious uh, they were very chill about it and didn't try to correct me uh, at all. Um, hmm. Nice but, chat. Yeah, I mean, just in general, like, it, is how often do you, I'm assuming it's mostly remote, or have you traveled much to work with the team? All my recordings have been remote. Um, except for when we recorded the uh, videos for... Um, last year or well, it was released last year yeah the one with the primals which i think was only on the blu-ray and um the one with keiko that is on youtube that that was done there but everything else has been remote um which is interesting i mean i would i would love to be able to be in the same room as him uh doing a recording sometime it's just logistically you know <laughs> there's a lot that goes into that and we're on literally opposite sides of the world so it's kind of expensive <laughs> It's an expensive session to fly me over to do that. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe one day everything will line up. We'll be in the same city at the same time. And that would be cool. Is the direction process like real time or sometimes do you kind of like lay tracks down and then get notes like later? So this is actually a really unique process and it makes me feel very valued and appreciated by Soken. He has me record usually three takes. One take just totally as written. Uh, another take with a few added embellishments. And a third take with me doing whatever the hell I want, pretty much. And from oh, those takes, cool. he will comp uh, a final take. And he often will choose the things that I come up with myself. And so it really feels like it's a collaboration. And even though it's not happening in real time, he gives me a lot of freedom and... um like respects what I do enough to often put it in the final product. That's, that's cool. Really cool. Yeah. So you get to listen to your own and be like, oh, that's, oh, oh, oh you got, he got that part. Nice. Ah, surprising. Yeah. So, like, in, I, I don't, maybe you guys haven't played 16, but maybe you've heard my star at the end. Star, their whole little, like, ooing kind of uh, improvised run that I did that was not written. And he just left it in there. 
And that was really cool. Nice. nice. Appreciated that. I, I think yeah. we're like a third of the way through 16. We we started it and then we started getting into the N Walker mix and and we're like something mm-hmm. has to pause for right now. So oh, we'll know yeah. the ooing when we hear it because of yeah, Crystal we Tower. We'll we're ooing. professionals. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm actually going to start playing 16 um, on Wednesday this week. Nice. I'm excited. Nice. Yeah. That game is so rad. Um, I really liked it. I, as someone who I grew up playing Devil May Cry, that game like it was that scene of Ratatouille when it takes you back to your childhood. It's like, Ooh, Oh, this is some good video game. Yeah. Sweet. I have to watch Ratatouille again. <laughs> you mentioned doing the live shows. Um, I'm, I'm, we're going to slide in a couple of questions from our community along the way. And, um, one of our community members from our discord goes by Bercy was curious what the process of touring with distance, uh, distant worlds was like, and I think there's more of that this year, as a matter of fact. I have not um, done my first show with them yet. So oh, so I this is your first. To... Oh, shoot. Yeah. Rad. Uh, I, there's the New York one, I think, is coming up soon, isn't it? Or soonish. Yes. Yeah. New York and Seattle. And um, the, uh, another one that um, I think has been announced <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Go to the official website and look yeah, at it so we don't get a man in trouble. You guys can Google that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, that's cool. Um, well, yeah, I guess I guess a, June, so. I guess a lookalike would be like like what's it like preparing to go do FanFest, for example, like FanFest Vegas? Because um, I mean, behind the scenes, we started talking to your team about doing this. I think December or November of last year. Yeah, we were like, "What about January?" And they're like, "FanFest Japan." We're like, "Oh, right, <laughs> that's a thing." Yeah. Um, so I have yeah. to imagine it's quite the lead up. Well, it was quite the lead up for the first one because I had to um, learn all the music, right? And but a lot of the songs I had already sung, well, actually all of them I had already recorded at least. But as we were just talking about, you know, the process of recording is very different from the process of then performing. Um so I, even though I had done it and I like was aware of the music, I then needed to get it so memorized in my brain that I was not concerned about screwing up lyrics, which to be honest, I didn't start the memorization process as early as I should have. Cause I was like, oh, I've recorded these. That's fine. They're pretty much in there, but <laughs> Lord, Oh, mighty the lyrics. They're so wordy. The What Angel Wakes Me is wordy as heck, but they yes. all are. They're all super wordy. Um, so, yeah, I was just, like, a few days before I left for Vegas, I would just spend, you know, 30 minutes before I went to bed, when I would wake up, whenever I had time to just look over my music or pull up the lyrics and just drill it. <clears throat> drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. Close my eyes, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it. Brush my teeth, drill it, drill it, drill it. Um, on the airplane, the entire ride, which wasn't long from from LA, you know, just drilling lyrics. Got into the hotel, drilling lyrics. <laughs> First rehearsal, drilling lyrics. Um, and, and then also... Seeing to make sure that I memorize the arrangement too, because the arrangement in the recording that I made were slightly different from the arrangement that Keiko wrote for the performance. So sometimes there would be three measures and there were actually four or like three beats when there was four. And I had to visually remember what the sheet music looked like in my head. Oh too. no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. I don't think I messed up in Vegas at all. I think I was, it was so ingrained in my mind at that point but then some time had elapsed i was nervous as hell though i mean i I was nervous i was nervous for the lyrics i wasn't nervous for the actual performance itself i don't really get nerves i get adrenaline which is great you want adrenaline when you're performing but i don't i don't have fear you know um except for oh no if i say this word instead of that word, this word is from the third verse and this one's from the first. The fans will know. They're going to think I'm a hack. <laughs> like, I gotta get this right. <laughs> <laughs> so mostly, it was mostly a lyric thing that was stressing me out. Um, and then, yeah, some time had elapsed, obviously, between Vegas and London. And I still, like, 
I, I waited very long to start drilling the lyrics again. And um, I think I did mess up a little bit in London, but you know, that's a part of live performance and the show must go on literally. And, and you somehow like manage to get back to where you're supposed to be. And most people don't even realize that something happened. And then um, in Tokyo, at the Tokyo Dome, I asked for the lyrics to be on the monitors, which that was the first time I had ever requested that because I kind of like to pride myself on being totally memorized, mostly because it gets me completely present, completely in that world that I'm trying to inhabit. Um, if I'm kind of looking down at lyrics every now and then, maybe it kind of pulls me out. But I was nervous because that was being live streamed, going down in history forever, forever and ever. And I just wanted to have a backup. So I did ask for lyrics in Tokyo. And it was nice to have that. Did I feel like it pulled me out of my world just slightly? But not so much that it made much of a difference in my performance. Oh, my goodness. I didn't think of the the changes. You would think you know, like Shakespeare kind of has this pattern to it so it's oh it's easy to memorize because it's like poetry it just but the music can change or they might do it and you memorize it that way and how do you even know what song back then is going to have this huge impact for fans and they'll want to hear it three you know years later it falls out of your head you're done with the play ah never will i have to be that person again no it just comes up and sneaks up on you with changes that sounds how do you have a favorite tongue twister how do you do you go through with like angels and like say, I'm going to breathe here because I don't get to breathe for the next minute? Oh, my gosh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you just you have to take really quick catch breaths. And that's something that mm, you become kind of adept at when you're singing classical music. Especially if you're singing music with a lot of melismas. Um, melismas are really quick notes, like 16th notes. Ba -da -da, ba -da -da, that kind of like you hear it in Bach, you hear it in early music. Um, Rossini, some bel canto has a lot of really quick um, melismatic passages. And often with that kind of singing, you, you only get like an eighth note, an eighth rest, which is very quick, to breathe. And you have to be able to not only get a lot of air, but breathe in the way that sets you up to sing well in the next passage, because you can bring, you can breathe like that and everything's red and flat to my, and my mouth is kind of smooshed and I don't have a lot of space or you can breathe really quickly in the shape of the next vowel you're going to sing singers. That's a really important oh, hack. pro move. Yeah. Breathe in the shape of the first vowel you're going to sing. Um, and, and you just kind of learned how to do that quickly. So though what Angel Wakes Me is extremely challenging, uh, you just kind of figure it out and <laughs> take quick match breaths and keep going. <laughs> I think that was right before we, we bowed out for fear of spoilers, Kyle, because the piano concert started. We're like, oh, wait, we've done Titania. We can stick for this. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it, it was so impressive. And then it was, it was this real light, turning on moment for me of kind of getting the what the full experience of fan fest is about and why the fans of this event are they're so passionate about it because it, it just kind of set it up to the next level um yeah what, what just to stay with what angel wakes me for for a moment like I, I was trying to describe it to friends and so so i think you just i think I clearly have not internalized the word that you just explained, but I was just like, I, it was like the, the singer came out, I think her name's Amanda. And it was the most crazy staccato, like live singing I've ever experienced. Cause I, I like live music, but I most, I go to like punk rock shows. I'm not used to what you're capable of. <laughs> so it, punk rock like, shows are great too. I go to those also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 I was very impressed. Um, and like I said, it was such a, a tonal shift from what I had experienced all day that I was like, wow, the fact that you can just, this is next and it works and it blends, um, impressed me endlessly. And I was just, I was so glad we got to see, even though we did get to see you perform the next day with the primals. Um, and what a cool tone shift that was so getting to come out floating. doing the rock star thing. So much fun. Oh my yeah, gosh. That was yeah. flow together, right? Mm -hmm. We were not familiar with the song at the time. I was I, I've done so much digging today trying to jolt my memory 
of what happened at the Primals concert because it, it, it's not a part of the stream. Uh, some wonderful person out there posted a set list somewhere. <laughs> That's how I was able Thanks. to remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we were completely unfamiliar with that track at the time and only very recently have seen it in context of where it falls in the game, which we won't get into. But um, uh, the track is uh, a track's incredible. So fun. It's it's so great to see how Sokin um, just e- even wants to do all of these different arrangements of the songs that are in the game. I think that's really what makes Final Fantasy XIV so unique and stand out and, and part of the reason why um, players love the music so much because he goes above and beyond with all of the iterations of the the music, you know, not just in bringing motifs throughout the game, but just in doing completely different arrangements, a rock band arrangement, a piano arrangement, orchestral arrangement. Like some people would just have good music and leave it there. And he's like, no, I want to be in a band. Let's go. Let's do rock. <laughs> <laughs> he's just such a rock star. He literally is, you know, and, and I relate to that. And um, and he, he just wants to make it fun for himself, I think, primarily, which as an artist, I think that's a very important thing. You want to you want to do work that is really satisfying for you on a soul level. And if you really resonate and relate to the work that you're putting out, your audience will. And I think that's just how Sokin operates. And he does what he wants to do. And it's so good. And it's really it just elevates the entire experience for everybody. Yeah, it was, it was we, we we were both talking about it. We're like, boy, it's it's like we're not sure if it's mass on or mass off moment when the whole band comes out and everyone's just rock stars because when they're on stage just doing a panel or when you bump into them in the hallway, they're them, they're so down to earth and gracious. Uh, and then on stage, bam, they're just absolute <laughs> rock stars. And honestly, Especially this interview with oh, you, gee. <laughs> well, this interview with you too is a very similar is because up yeah. until this point, you know, we, we've seen a few clips of you here and there, but we've been avoiding. Uh, a lot of like react requests until we were done with Endwalker. And so mm-hmm. up until this point, our experience with you, Amanda has been, you were awesome at fan fest. And that was kind of, it was kind of it. And it's like, Oh, you're down to earth as well. <laughs> you see? Yeah. And yeah. of course, yeah. loading screen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think that's what's really <laughs> awesome about the dev team because um, they all want to connect with uh with the fans and with you guys so much they they don't put themselves on a pedestal they're obviously they take their work very seriously but then they are super down to earth and they want to connect and they're humorous and they're fun and you know the fact that it, that is modeled from the top it trickles down to every element of the game and you know for me and jason to see that uh and experience that in these big events that can be really stressful um, you know, it just, it really, I'm, I, I feel like I'm in the right place and Jason, he's, he's such a pal now. It's great. He's, he's very similar where he's just like so down to earth and such a sweetheart, you know, and it really feels like the, the vibe attracted the tribe, the right people kind of, uh, Ooh. come together into the, into this project. I really agree. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. Like you said uh, about trickling down to the game, because it's something that when we take time to talk about kind of the, the macro aspects of, of the narrative of Final Fantasy XIV, well, sometimes we catch ourselves being like, how does this all blend? Like it, it, it has such highs and lows, but it's all, it can also be really funny. It can be full on absurdist at times <laughs> and then bring you right back down to some of like the most emotionally impactful things you've, you've ever seen in a video game or really any narrative it can transcend genre. And so I probably shouldn't have been so surprised, I guess, when <laughs> when I saw that kind of present in person at an event like FanFest. But now that we've, the two of us have you know, seen at least through the end of Endwalker, we're like, oh yeah, it's this is just kind of Final Fantasy. It is all things at once at different times. Yeah. So. Yeah, perfect. But while we're talking musical spoilers, we're curious if you, do, do you... Do you have a dark? Can you kill your darlings? Do you have a, a overall favorite piece from Final Fantasy fourteen? And I'm I'm also curious if your favorite piece is different from your favorite piece to perform live. Well, um, because I haven't gotten that far into MSQs, um, I, I feel like the majority of the music that I have been exposed to has been through the Symphony and the Fan Fest. 
Um, I I really like the Primal's arrangement of the Titan theme song. It's just so epic, oh, and yeah. I, I go so hard when we hear that line. Like in London, Alex and Husky and I were all uh, on a dock in Limsa Lominsa watching the concert, and we just had a mosh pit <laughs> during the Titan song. <laughs> it was so much fun. I don't think there's video footage of it anywhere, but it happened. <laughs> So I, I really like that one, and, and I've played and I've heard that in games. So um, that was really exciting to really resonate with that song and then to be able to experience it while I was playing. So as far as one that I don't sing, I think currently that's my favorite. One that I really enjoy singing that I haven't performed live that I really want to is Return to Oblivion. Because it's so rangy, you have all of this kind of like spoken range mid voice stuff, and then the vocal jumps up on top of the staff. And it's really intense, and um, I just like that uh, dis distinction that is made between the energy and the intensity of that song. It's really fun, and I, I just I just really want to perform that live. I, I try to like. Talk to Soken and Keiko, like, hey, can we can we program this? <laughs> I really want to do this one live. It's so crazy. <laughs> but I think my my favorite to sing is um probably flow. <laughs> because he, he wrote it for me, you know? When, when we did Tomorrow and Tomorrow, he hadn't worked with me yet. He remembered kind of how I sounded at that concert and, and I think wrote in a range that he thought would suit me. But then after he had worked with me on, on different recordings, um, he really had a good understanding of what I could do. And then Flo felt so unique and special and written for me. So I, it just really, hits a, a, a sentimental place in my heart when I sing it, because I'm like, this is my song. <laughs> and I've never had that experience before. I can, I can tell you that it definitely has a sentimental hit for a lot of folks, at least in our community mm -hmm. as well. Like it was when, when we hit that point in the game, um, chat was losing their minds. <laughs> uh, and while I was digging today, not that I would ever condone uh, unofficial video from uh, something that wasn't streamed, um, you know, I found live performances of that that I wasn't there for, and the instant audible gasp when the first few notes on the piano hit is just... It, I have to imagine that was... Uh, it was cool to be on stage for that moment. Yeah, it was emotional, um, especially the first time I heard it in Vegas because I, I heard a gasp and immediate, like, sniffles, you know? I was like, okay, gotta hold it together. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> Not the because <laughs> you know it's the crying is is kind of contagious you you hear people crying around you you can start crying too you know and like well i'm not allowed to cry <laughs> i have to sing this song <laughs> <laughs> well along the lines of um you know not not knowing where it falls uh someone in our discord um at bella asks what song are you most interested in seeing how it does fit into the story now as you're going through the game yourself. All of the ones I sing. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Fair. I think. <laughs> uh, uh, spoilers. I mean, what even right? wakes me, too? Uh, I, you know, just because that song is, is so fun and, and... Dancing on the wind, up and down again, round and round the bend, fa la 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 From a flowery bed to the clouds ascend, tumble down again, fa la 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 
It just sounds like an evil fairy princess song, and that's the visual I have in my head. And so I'm curious to see if I'm anywhere close to that visual when I get I'm to going, that in the game. I'm gonna engage my poker face and simply yes. say, "Interesting." Interesting. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I will say spoilers. Um, every time a song with you ends up in the game, it's usually a banger of a moment. Uh, in game as well as as well as the song itself yeah so yeah it was, it was uh it was some good stuff I, I i mean kyle you and i have an answer because we still haven't gotten to this point um i'm very excited to see where scream comes in because we heard the song Ooh. at fan fest still hasn't showed up in game <laughs> don't know when it's coming Sometimes. i'm excited to see there are when. many many mysteries yeah wow yeah but it sounds like since you were conveyed in production, too, it's very easy to assume that, you know, the movie magic and you had a video of what was happening before your eyes and you were sent everything it sounded like you were given raw emotions and your three takes. And now there's a mystery waiting for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that will happen in um, recording sessions in L.A. when you're working on a film. Um, they will be playing the scene behind and. I, I recorded, I actually have not seen it, but the live action Mulan I sang in and um, I got to see some really intense scenes in the background while the choir was recording. You know, that was so cool. That was actually my next question because IMDb is still catching up when it comes to voice work in general. So what would you point people to to be like, I did this, Go go look at this. I, you know, as I said, Mulan, I realized I don't even think I have that in my IMDb. No, it's here. Credit. We got oh, that one. Yep, that one's there. Oh, okay, cool. Great. I'm glad. I don't even remember anymore. To see stuff that I've done, I don't know. You know, it's hard because so much of classical music when I'm record or when I'm performing with orchestras, often they're union orchestras, and so they have rules and laws against live recording. Sure. So there's there's archival <laughs> recordings that the soloists can't get their hands on because that's illegal. So I don't I don't really have a lot of um like classical recordings. I have some bootleg stuff that is on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Things. Uh, yeah, it's actually difficult to put together a reel, uh, something that I, I need to kind of figure out and do. And I'm like, I really don't actually have a lot of footage of me doing these things that I do. And they certainly don't record that kind of stuff when you're doing um, sessions because you're under a big old NDA um, in Hollywood. So, yeah, it's just kind of like, well, I sang in this film in the choir and I'm on there. <laughs> Score vocalist. That. Yeah, that yeah. seems to be the the name that they got you under for a lot of these. Score yeah. vocalist. There we go. That's yeah. true. <laughs> I'm also curious just about because you you were at all three fan fests from the most recent. I don't want to call it a tour. That seems strange, but the, the most recent fan fest season. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Because well, uh, yeah. Dasna Bog in our uh, Discord was curious if there was a unique vibe at each one mm. and if you thought songs that were played at all three hit harder at different venues. I know you mentioned that it seemed like America kind of like brings a lot of energy to their reaction. Yeah. I think that's very American. I think. <laughs> <laughs> we just rock out balls to the wall. It's great. Used to, used to um, the mosh pit situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would say that, yeah, the energy was the most raucous at the North American Fan Fest. Um, and, and London and, and Europe was was there too. Um, they were also really high energy, but um, not quite as like awesomely chaotic as the American one. Um, and Tokyo, I mean, it's, it's just culturally more like focused and respectful. And I definitely experienced that um, at the Eurasian Symphony where there was absolutely no vocalizing. There was only clapping. And when there was a moment that was exciting, um, the clapping would intensify. We're not contained, trapped behind these claps. Please, no appreciation. 
Yeah. But at the fan fest, there was a lot more uh, like vocal hooting and hollering, um, but still just um, kind of like focused and intentional. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how other areas might respond differently. That's kind of how I imagined it would go, though, based on like ideas of different cultures and places in the world. Mm. Uh, that makes sense. Also, I'm sure the well, chair situation has a large impact because if everyone's seated in stadium seating, yeah. they probably go more clap. But as if there's a floor, oh, that's yeah. a good like, point. Like breaks yeah. out a little bit because there was yeah, seating yeah, yeah. at other fan fests, right? Because whereas uh, the Vegas one, they removed seating when it was time for the Primals concert, anyway. Now that I'm thinking back, because I when I was talking about the Japanese fan fest just now, I, I was actually <clears throat> thinking about a lot of the daytime stuff, but during the evening because that venue was so freaking big i had to have my both in ears in and um in london and vegas i had one in and one out so i could hear a lot more of the room and sokin was definitely like mc riling up the audience and when he was really getting them into it they were very very loud but again i was still i still had my in ears in so i couldn't hear it as well as if i didn't have them in so they responded well to Sokin. <laughs> he got them going. <laughs> I'm remembering a, an interesting experience now that I had that uh, was a very like intensely quiet moment. So um, when I walked out to do the piano concert, that stage was really big. And um, it was just Keiko's piano on the stage and nothing else. Whereas during the rehearsals the day before, there was all the band stuff and they still weren't done setting the stage. So the stage was very full of things. Um, <clears throat> but then during the concert, you know, my time is there. We got to go. There's no, There wasn't a spotlight on me. I had to walk in the darkness a very long distance. Um, and it was, you could hear a pin drop. It was so silent. And I was just like... Don't trip, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip. Don't trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I get there. And then what's the first song that I sing? What Angel Wakes Me? And my heart was like racing out of my chest. You know, again, it wasn't nerves that were negative, but just the adrenaline and the, oh my gosh, it's, it's finally happening. It's here. I'm in Tokyo Dome. This is totally bananas. Yes, I was re rehearsing here the day before, but now that there's all these butts in the seats and they all have lights on, it's just a completely different experience. <laughs> so that was really wild to walk out in the complete and utter silence. And then once the song started playing, then the spotlight came up and I was like, all right, take big ass breath and go. <laughs> Into the first song that is, of course, quite yeah. breath intensive too. So what a, yeah. what a lineup, what a... Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. You don't think about those little things from the outside. I'm like, oh, man, I hope they're sneaking. All right. Like, <laughs> I hope they got a chance to breathe on their way out. Dude, does the drama of the live effects like the spotlight coming up, the, the, uh, does that have a, a like a helpful momentum for when you're stuck in the moment? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of like when it's for actors or for people who dress up in fun clothes, sometimes you don't feel like you're totally in character until you put the costume on. Um, it's like that on stage, you know, when the spotlights are really all on you and everyone's got their butts in the seat. It's like it's game time. We are in it now. And it, it just hits differently. And it's really exciting. I love to hear that. It took me too long to learn that as someone who's I've done like hosting gigs for for live crowds and it's just fun. I was like, I need I need I need a wardrobe for this. I need to wear something other yes. than what I wear every day because it kind of mm. snaps you into the role. It um, totally does. Makes a big difference. I'd like to shift gears a little bit here and mm. and talk about playing the game and 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 your life now, your streaming life that that is now uh, a, a part of your of your weekly experience. Um Twitch. so I think I'll Yes, twitch.tv slash the real crystal mommy and YouTube at the real crystal mommy. Oh, nice. You got some some LED signage back there. Mommy. <laughs> Good branding. Well done. I leaned was, into it. Yeah, might as well. Might as well. There, yeah. there was so much of that going on when folks in our chat were like, you should watch some of Amanda's videos, but they just were like, watch the crystal mommy. I'm like, are we allowed to? Say that? Who's? 
It's caught off guard. I, yeah. I mean, I think when I when I first started getting called mommy or mom or mother, I had no idea what the heck was going on. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, I think it's because Heidelin is kind of like the mother of the universe. Got it. Okay, mommy. Got and it. then I was like, oh, there's a lot of different uh, contexts for that word as well. But whatever. Here we are. It's fine. I can lean into that. Too. <laughs> yeah, it was the time period. Right as you started streaming, too, that was like the popular... Pika. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. The audience will but, audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The audience, in fact, will audience. You guys did. Yeah. Yeah. The audience. <laughs> but, but we obviously it's a big game and you have made your way through a massive chunk of it being a realm reborn here. What did Before you, we, yeah? I, I want to, I want to just drop a disclaimer. Spoiler alert. If you're just starting a Final Fantasy 14 journey, we're going to we're going to talk about up to the point that Amanda is at, which is the very beginning of Heaven's Ward. So those are the only spoilers on the table for right now. Yep. Yeah. But I'm curious about your your most recent like major endpoint, which would be finishing Realm Reborn. How did you enjoy Realm are born. I'm, I'm sure there are quite a few aspects to you kind of experiencing the game. Yeah, I'm watching. I'm watching the cutscene right now because this is like the the scene that I was gonna talk about. Well, I've never played an MMO before, um, so I I guess I I didn't know exactly um, how much backstory would uh, be involved there, of which there is a lot. Um, kind of coming from the 1.0 and switching over to the 2.0 and kind of understanding that transition really helped. I just watched the No Clip documentary and that kind of gave me even more context for some of the ways that A Realm Reborn was flowing and set up. But again, never having played an MMO, I was like, oh, how many hours is it going to take me to get to um, Endwalker? What, like 200? <laughs> like, with, you know, other video games that I played in <laughs> the like, 90s, you know. I don't think I ever played a game that was more than 40 hours of gameplay. So that was the last time I had played video games, um, like Nintendo 64 in the 90s. So um, fast forward to now, there's a lot there's a lot, and to be honest, it was a bit overwhelming as my first MMO. I, yeah, um, I can assume, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I have a lot of um, mods who are. Um, I, I like to call them lore whores. <laughs> um, help remind me things, and we help. have a new name for John Kyle. Wow. <laughs> I love or story it. Story slut, but I, 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 I oh, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, it's a range. Yeah, absolutely. It's a range. There's a range. So as long as I'm surrounded by said lore horrors, I feel um, confident that if there are important bits that I missed, because sometimes I'll talk over cutscenes that are important because I don't realize they're important because me and chat are going off on a tangent. Well, how, how could you, right? Like you're, it's so much bedrock. As you can assume for the, the yeah. pyramid that's being built out of this storyline that eventually led to the songs that you're going to hear yourself here in the video game. Uh, yeah, there's, there's probably some things in there that don't make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and, you know, the the end of A Realm Reborn with the fucking twist surprise there was really exciting for me because some things started to kind of crystallize all of the bedrock and the leading up kind of really connected for me for kind of the first time and got me really riled up and surprised. Like, I did not see this coming, what we're watching right now. Um, and I definitely wanted to punch Ilbert through the screen many times. I was really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Working and as I was, intended. I was just frankly excited that there was such a twist that totally took me off guard and i was like oh okay final fantasy 14 i see you <laughs> yeah i you know it, it's it's subjective but a lot of us and i am in this camp a lot of folks feel that realm reborn is is a slow burn and so mm -hmm. the banquet scene it's it's a pop-off moment it, yeah. it's where okay is this was a build this is what yeah. we were getting to yeah, I'm curious to see now if how the speed of the development of the story progresses. 
like I said, I'm still in the beginning of Heaven's Word, partially because I started doing Dark Knight, and that's its own yes. series. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my main job. So yeah, you did exactly okay. what I did. Uh, Kyle had to wait for me because I didn't want to yeah. get yeah. off of Dark Knight to continue yeah. Heaven's Word. I'm like, I need yeah. a couple days, dude. I just let me get my levels. Yeah, yeah. Warning, if anyone is wanting to watch me playing Dark Knight, I have... I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I've kind of realized that the entire thing is a big dick joke. Hmm. I am unaware of this. You gotta like hold it in both hands and it's a big sword. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> and you reread some of this, I mean, some of the dialogue, it's just full of it. So yeah, lots of grasping. Yeah, of yeah. Scene, I can um, see it. I point out a lot of the dick jokes. I see this is where I effed up. I didn't stream my Dark Knight quests because, like, in the moment, chat will let you know the second anything could even maybe possibly be one percent of an innuendo. So, <laughs> well, now you know a little bit about my streaming style too. I, I go okay. there. We're 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 respectfully degen, um, <laughs> as as one should be online. Yeah, always the best way to live. Too. I just didn't pick yeah. up on that with Dark Knight. Now I feel I feel left out. But I'm, thank you for enlightening me. You're welcome. Yeah. I made you blush a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're all going to be looking. He just knows what you've unleashed on him over the coming months as they, as we all collectively. Oh, yeah. The, the next extreme we do, folks will be like, yeah, you, uh, you grew him with both hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very important. Yeah, right. Very important. Yeah. You have a firm grip. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. I'm just all right. I'm bracing. I'm ready for this now. So definitely a okay. standout moment. Like just the fight scene pops off. The graphics are flying. Game of Thrones is heavy in the air. <laughs> Was there anything before or after that? You are you just kind of went, oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, that's interesting. Even if it was just like just text going by the screen. I mean, I, I wasn't entirely convinced that she was murdered. <laughs> I was like, okay, I feel like this is an elaborate setup here and I don't I don't have this emotional response to her being poisoned because I just she can't possibly be dead. <laughs> like that every everything up to that point was like she's dead, she's murdered, it happened, you know. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That can't be right. That can't be right. So I think I was just it was fun for me to kind of have my own narrative and understanding going on there and like a little bit of denial and refusal to believe that this terrible travesty had actually happened. And yeah, it just it was great because I'm like, we all right, we got a mystery here now. And I feel more connected and invested to this story and i'm curious to see what's happening because i frankly don't believe that this could have possibly happened so what's the story here that is a lot of content to go through i'm giving a little scroll here just to kind of see everything you've been through of recent i just remember boxes so many boxes for illbird <laughs> before the reveal and just being like why have i got to click on one more box oh of dialogue uh, no, it was just like there was an actual cr pickup crates quest uh, with oh. the Crystal Braves. It, it and I, it was it was a moment. Where oh I, yeah, where the patch content almost broke me. I think I blocked that out of my memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's not the most riveting, but I do remember because we we were still weren't streaming our gameplay yet, so <laughs> I was playing privately, and I was just like, okay, well, I, I liked I liked where things were going before this. What what's happening here? And then the bloody banquet comes, and you're like. Got it. Okay. Yeah. We're good. Then, We're good. then it hits home. Yeah. I mean, I, I think back with like PTSD on the um, wine port fetch quests. Oh. On for mm. like hours and hours. Oh, God. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> you, is that, that's, half, that's just after Costa del Sol, I think. Because aren't you bring wine yeah, to exactly. the big wig out in Costa yeah. del Sol? Yeah. At least you get to hear Costa del Sol's music every time because that. That, that oh, freaking cool. track, I love it. And then didn't we find out in an interview that Sokin didn't have maracas, so he used dry ramen cup as maracas for that track? I think yep, that's that the, was the word. I think that's the factoid on the Costa del Sol track that everyone So, so they Japanese. say, but I believe oh it. Didn't have maracas kind of I choose to believe it. I love it's, it. It's, it we, want, we saw it with our own eyes. It, it was so good in, in an interview telling that story. So it's not like the unattributed factoids that get fired up in our chat that we have learned not to trust. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that that kind of I love hearing that kind of stuff. It's it's freaking <laughs> fantastic. What did you think of like the the core group, like the the scions, kind of getting cast to the wind at the end of Realm Reborn? Okay, honestly, I think I was just so excited to have like gotten to the end that I don't know how I felt at that moment. That's fair. <laughs> that is fair. I'm like, wait, do I have something to say? Wait, no. <laughs> well, it is the internet. We tier list things. So uh, yeah. favorite scions at this moment then. Well, it was Thancred, um, but then he had that whole weird issue with the Asians, and then I kind of lost favor for him. Um, <laughs> poor, and, poor guy. <laughs> you know, like, oh, even even that. after he, you know, yeah, like I tried to protect everybody during the bloody Ooh. banquet. It's just I don't want to like um, ERP with him anymore. Oh, get, get involved with that. It's, yeah, it's a little messy. Yeah. Yeah. Romantically, no, we can be friends. Just want to uh, date one person at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that my, <laughs> my new crush is, well, not necessarily, but um, my, my new crush is Minfilia. I want to be like the gal pal that um, everyone thinks we're just friends, but like we go on long extended trips together and um, to Costa del Sol and we're not just friends. <laughs> Fabulous choice. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my fave currently. <laughs> I believe Kyle was and still is a number one Minfilia fan in, in the Grinding Gear community. I, I am a Cyclops enjoyer. I love, maybe <laughs> people call them boring, but I always got to respect the person holding the ship together. And there's a lot of um, personality full scions, you could say. And it's nice to yeah. have Minfilia around to keep things actually working. It's hard to be a boss, babe. You know, you got to know how to say what you need people to do and be compassionate and effective with the things you need them to drive out. Like, she is big inspo for all boss babing out there. <laughs> well, what about so, your uh, fellow bridge through the snow walking buddy, Alphano? Where is he ranking for you? Annoying in a role board. <laughs> Now that Colin is doing the voice acting, it's slightly less. <laughs> I like Colin's voice. It makes it, it's a different effect. <laughs> <He's> so based. <laughs> uh, I'm glad they made okay. that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Your honorary grad gear member. Yeah, because that was exactly good company. Our good experience. company. Good company. All around. Oh my god. Yeah. Kyle had to talk me off a couple ledges. I'm like, what? What is with this? Like. Does Yoshi P have a, a son named Alphano? Like, what is? Why is this the most important character? So bossy. Yeah. He's so bossy. Yeah, but he he's starts so haughty. To, starts to take a turn. Starts to take a turn at the beginning of Heaven's Ward. It becomes mm. a more like depth, like more depth to that character. Yeah. Definitely. Beyond just which, which is interesting, Kyle, because you know you saying, oh, I you know I must defend the the leaders of the group that try and hold things together. Alphano also kind of falls into that. Into that archetype. Mm. He's a bit of the Leonardo, you know, Cyclops. I get without Minfilly in the room, but there you're just. You know, when everyone is cast of the wind, yeah. You got, you got Minfilia right there, Minfilia. Well, then you just, you, like, you look back at just the absolute. I'm scrolling through it right now, and I just see the pile of quests that made up uh, the patch content here with Snow Cloak and Keeper of the Lake. And you're like, sweet. Oh, we almost made it. You know, we almost did it all. <laughs> And then you got 2.55, which is what, 10 hours long? Easy to get through? 2.55 is long. Yeah. And yeah, that's a lot. Welcome back. That's a lot. Welcome back. Oh, this, yeah, there's is a, lot, a lot of patch, a lot of patch, patch, patchy, patch, patch. <laughs> patchy, patch, patch. Yep. In, indeed. Um, which, I mean, I get, like, you know, if if I had been playing along in real time and have had the months to get through and then I was like, whoa, I'm bored, what do I do? And then the patch come and then I am doing it all in real time, that's great. But if you're doing it like us, where you have 10 years <laughs> of lore to get through, you know, it's it's a very intensive process. Um, and, yeah, yeah I, honestly, I feel like I could probably start taking notes <laughs> <laughs> you, you, well, you, it was, you have assistance you have assistance as yeah. well but also like it's a great game to just kind of feel the vibe of it and be, I mean, I'm, today I'm doing uh, Gold Saucer we're going to go over here I feel like we're in some dungeons there's so much you can do in the game that's not 
MSQ or just, yeah. it's a great conversation piece. I think that's the funnest thing about streaming it is you just, you put it on, you're like, here is the absolute breadth of conversation that we can have. And even saying I'm, I'm level 53 or whatever, it's still a lot you get to talk about with an audience. Oh, yeah. I think I talk about um, a lot of things that aren't the MSQ um, so much that my mods are like, MSQ, do the MSQ. <laughs> <laughs> I do all of everything else very easily. <laughs> but that's what I love about 14 is that there are so many things you can do that aren't the storyline. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole universe. And that's so cool. Never what? experienced that before. We have a phrase in our community now, courtesy of Jesse, that is click the thing, click the thing. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. We, can't, we, yeah. And you've really kind of like branched out in your stream here. You have other streams going on too, whether musically or you're having a guest over. Like it's cool to see how much yeah. that has grown over the last six months. So fun. I've done two um, music concerts and I'm actually doing one this coming Sunday. If anyone wants to jump on, um, it's all like song requests stuff and i've got a, a, a wide variety of, of songs and genres i do and i i learned i learned some video game songs last time i learned snake eater which is just my absolute new favorite thing to sing um learned simple and clean from kingdom hearts learned a near song so that was fun to kind of expand my uh uh video game musical uh, her uh, horizons and learn some new stuff there yeah but yeah so i've been doing concerts i've done this these couch streams twice once with ben once with jesse the next one i haven't scheduled it yet but it's going to be with jason charles miller nice. and um and we'll probably do some singing and stuff and what i'm actually really excited about is i bought last season's set of hot sauces from hot ones which is a mm. interview show on youtube that you guys seem like you're familiar I, with i got a, uh, the two hottest ones in my stocking for christmas this year <laughs> did you get the bomb i did yeah, uh, yeah. my my wife katie uh loves hot sauce and yeah. loves watching me wince so that was in my stocking and i got nice. the bomb and the last ab yeah so. the bomb's crazy because it doesn't hit you it takes like a minute yeah, and okay. when it does, it's just like pain. There's like it's almost pain. no flavor. It's no flavor. Oh it just hurts. Yeah. But I just imagine that, you know, it really does build on each other when you sit down and you do them all in one sitting and it's all in a span of like 25 minutes, you know, because I can have a little bit of the last dab and be like, this is good. But if that was literally the 10th session of hot sauce that i had in 25 minutes i'd probably be screaming and crying so anyway me and jason charles miller are gonna do that on the next oh my goodness <laughs> yes. that's so, fantastic <laughs> and then i think we'll probably like try and attempt to sing a song together after well we that, it's, it's a, the natural next question however horrifying the thought might be uh, i will be very amusing so thank you for knowing yeah, what we exactly. all want in that particular scenario the <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, will there be costumes? Um, because the clips that have come out of your streams with guests are so highly entertaining. Yeah, yeah always. I I am gonna get. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna have it like a cowboy hat. Uh, so he's the cowboy of darkness, you know. So I'm gonna be the cowgirl of awesomeness, of lightness. <laughs> well, <he's, laughs> yeah, like a white hat, black hat in in uh, exactly. westerns. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, that guy, good guy, yeah. So that that, that will definitely happen, and um, we'll see. I I have, I have uh, accessories of plenty in my closet, so it's fun to go through there. Mm. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's so good. Well, thank you for sharing. Well, yeah. um, I mean, while while you're talking about your stream, um, as we're winding down here, remind everyone where they can find you. Like your Twitch, your all of your socials. Where can where can folks tune in and, and catch up? Yeah, with the real all of Crystal it. Mommy. All of those things. Uh, Twitter. Um, uh, Amanda is it underscore Aiken? I just changed it actually. It's either Amanda dot Aiken or Amanda underscore Aiken. I believe it is underscore. Twitter, as someone who had to tag you a lot underscore. recently. My mods are probably like, you don't know, you know. <laughs> this is what it is. <laughs> Uh, no, sometimes I don't. Uh, so Twitter is a good place. Um, tw Twitch, obviously, the real crystal mommy. I have a Discord. Um, all of those links are in my link tree, which um, you guys have. And I'm on Instagram. Also, Instagram is such a weird 
platform that used to be the only one I was on. And then I got on Twitter and I was like, oh, wow, people are actually engaging here. That's cool. And so now I mostly do stuff on Twitter. The 14 um, audience seems particularly active mm-hmm. on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, and I, have a, I have a Crystal Mommy YouTube. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. And so we're, we're uploading um, the VODs and the couch streams and got some React videos on there. Right now, the no clip React, and we'll be doing more of those. So um, that's also the real Crystal Mommy on the YouTubes. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm around. You guys can find me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, everybody, make sure you go check that out. Um, yeah, the YouTube is how I was catching up on... Um, some of the the Ben stream that I wasn't able to catch live. Mm. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, very fun yeah. <laughs> for any of you. He had uh, so fa- much fun. He had never done um, a stream like that before. You know, he'd been in like production studios where they were filming it and then did something that wasn't live. But that was the first time he had ever actually like sat down on a Twitch stream and... It was fun. I was surprised that we went for four hours. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised because we have a good banter, but I thought, oh my gosh, she's going to get exhausted. Like, maybe we'll do this for two. And and we just kept going for four hours. And by the end of the night, he, after we logged off, he was just so tired. <laughs> That's surprising. Yeah, it's Ben Starr, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know who we're talking about, the voice actor for Clive in Final Fantasy XVI um, was on uh, your stream in person. Um, mm-hmm. And it's it's uh, it's just a riotous good time. Um, yeah, I was watching. I'm like, oh, I, Ben uh, I must stream all the time. It just seemed really natural. He fell right into no, it. No, he doesn't. And it was it was nice because he said, man, if we lived in the same city, like I would do this with you every week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on opposite sides of the world. <laughs> Well, I, I can attest if you say that enough times, uh, eventually one, one, someone will move. Like uh, Kyle, Kyle did that. I, mean, I told Kyle that enough times. I'm like, oh, this is so much fun in person. It's only natural. It's only natural. Yeah. It will Aww. happen. It will yeah, happen. You need a better weather in Europe. California. Yeah, the weather's nice, but I, I really want to move to Europe, actually. So that's like understandable in, in the ethos of what I'm wanting to do with my life. I, I, ideally, I'd like live half the time in Europe, half the time in L.A. Thanks, universe. That's going to happen. <laughs> that sounds lovely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, um, I know we wanted to have you out of here by about 5 p.m. So, um, yeah, th- thank you again so much for joining us. And uh, again, every- everyone fun. go follow Amanda everywhere. I see our uh, our mods have already been dropping some links in our chat. Oh, uh, but if you're watching. Yeah, if you're watching this after the fact, we have links in the description below. So please enjoy. Before we go, we want to thank our badass patrons for supporting us on Patreon. You can support everything that Kyle and I make together by going to supportourbromance.com. That will take you directly to our Patreon. And to some of our recent patrons, we want to thank Mobius Mechanicus, Melissa S., Joe McN., Kelsey, Xanthanarium and Brian G for signing up. We really appreciate it. And of course, there's a special level that we thank every episode. Huge thanks to our legendary level backers, Sean B, Mike R, Stephen J, Das, Cheesy Bob, Chris K, Lost Mythics, Wayra E, Zervon, Compsi Jedi, Darkman, Pothy P, Bloodsy Von Snugglegore, Avain, Shinny Geo, Nicholas C, Coral, Thalm, Jerry T, Sean and Jen in conjunction, Janet Y, and Vernacular Ham. Kyle and I use Doghouse Systems gaming PCs, so head on over to doghousesystems.com if you're in the market for a new PC, and use the code BROMANCE. You'll get upgraded to a free 2 terabyte NVMe SSD, and you'll support Kyle and myself in the process. Finally, follow us on Twitter. I'm Garrett Art, Kyle's at Kyle Ferguson, and we have a joint account at Garrett and Kyle. It's going to wrap it up for this episode. Thank you all so much for listening. GG.